Welcome everybody to another Mindful Social. This week, I'm really excited to have an old friend, Maddie Grant, join us on the show. And you know, we've known each other for quite a long time through nonprofit worlds. And I've really been excited about watching her career morph and change into some really interesting places. And so Maddie, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's um, it's great to to reconnect after yes, a very long time. So, um, I started out as a social media strategist. I had my own consulting firm called Social Fish, helping associations and nonprofits with social media. Um, and as in that work, um, we started to realize that social media actually changes how we manage and lead our organizations and not just how we market and communicate with our members and our customers and our donors. Uh, so things like um, organizations needing to become more transparent, more collaborative, more decentralized, more authentic. Um, all of these things are not social media issues at all. They're, they're management issues, right? It's just basically changing how we work. So in 2011, I wrote a book with my partner, Jamie Nodder, uh, called Humanize. And it basically spelled out all of those different ways that social media was changing um, how, we, how we work. Uh, and then um, three years later, in 2015, we realized that there was a huge catalyst to the things that we talked about in the book in Humanize, which was that the uh, millennial generation is now the dominant generation in the workforce, has just started this year, um, and is entering into management positions. So mm -hmm. the oldest millennials are in their early 30s. Um, and as managers, you know, as boomers start to retire, those of us, those of them who will retire, which is maybe not many, <laughs> but, you know, as millennials start to become uh, managers, they're not going to wait around to change things to suit the way that they have grown up. And obviously, um, the, you know, digital world is a big piece of that. Um, but we also identified some key principles um, in our next book which is called When Millennials Take Over, um, that really kind of plays out a lot of the ideas that had started out in Humanize, but um, are really catalyzed by the millennial generation pushing things forward now. Um, and the idea, the, the, the tagline, the, the subheader, subtitle is, is uh, preparing for the ridiculously optimistic future of business. So, you know, we're very future focused um, and it's really all about bridging the gap between millennials and boomers and Gen X and kind of changing the conversation away from complaining about millennials and kids these days and how entitled they are and <laughs> how they refuse to respect the nine to five and wear flip flops yeah, to work. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. Um, but, all of this is a long story short to say that all of the work that we've done has really been about culture change. So it started with social media um, and generational diversity, which is um, Jamie's background. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really all culture change. So now we have a new company called WorkXO, which um, helps organizations really understand their culture so that if if the culture isn't awesome you actually know have the tools to to change it you know mm -hmm. for the better but it's not just that it's also just having uh, language and vocabulary to describe the culture that you have so um, kind of a true authentic culture as opposed to the kind of marketing spin that we see a lot um, right. which is nice but not true and people show up at the workplace and they're like, you know, I was sold a bill of goods. So that's, that's sort of the realm in which we're working now. And it's it, it's interesting because it seems like I've done a lot of different things over the last 10 years that we've known each other. Mm -hmm. But it's all kind of in retrospect, it's all led to this place where I am now. Well, you know, I, I have to say that I, I love that. that. Are, we Are we hearing, hearing an echo? Uh -huh. No, I'm fine. You hearing it now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm not sure why. Hang on. Do you still hear an echo? I don't hear one at all. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's my mic then. Weird. Sorry. Um, 
I like to see people have a lot of evol evolution over their careers. And I like to see people make a lot of transitions because you learn something from everything that you do. And that's what makes you, you. And I think that's something that's lacking a lot in stories that companies are telling too. You know, really, you know, before the show, you and I talked about authenticity in a company and, and what that means. And you really have to have a history in order to be able to tell your story. Right. And, you know, to have a story that's really interesting, <laughs> kind of one flavor that isn't, doesn't take long to describe you. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's great that you've got that experience to grow into where you are now. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually very exciting work. Um, and I think there's a big focus on culture in general in the business world. There's a, an understanding that it matters. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with uh, generations of millennials, they care about that. Um, and it makes a difference to them um, in terms of what the what their employers care about and present themselves to the world as. Um, so it's just it's kind of it's a hot topic right now, but it's also very meaningful work, I think. Mm, yeah, and important. And I think in communicating with all of the generations, you know, I, I'm a boomer um, and I kind of have a millennial mindset in a lot of ways simply because I've been so embedded in social. And I think social has allowed us to kind of transcend some of those barriers that, you know, we would be stick in the muds. Oh, no, we have to stay right here and, you know, be part of the other side. <laughs> but, you know, social kind of enables us to communicate with people and and creates a better community for me anyway. Yeah, it's true. And and part of that, too, and the thing that I focus on a lot is the idea that an organization's culture has to have it has to protect some of the history and the um, maybe the old guard that has been part of that culture just as much as it needs to embrace change and new ways of working and digital and all of that stuff. So it's very much about how you, and this is where authenticity comes in, you know, how you authentically respect both sides of that spectrum because mm -hmm. you can't have one without the other but it's very easy to focus only on the front side. You know, we have to be super social. We have to, you know, attract millennials. How do we market to millennials? You know, how do we get more millennials to be our donors and um, our members and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it's actually, it'll, that part will come if you can authentically share, you know, how, how you as an organization got to where you are. Um, and, you know, there's multiple generations in your workplace. Like that's that's another piece of it is I think there's a lot of bitterness around, you know, a new group coming in, like pushing out the old group. But it doesn't actually work that way. There's there'll be decades with all of us all working together. So you're not going to put us on an iceberg right now. No, not at all. <laughs> and just want to clarify. The book is called When Millennials Take Over, which is hilarious because, of course, they don't. They don't. Take yeah. Over. <laughs> but they are starting to take over, as you said, and they're moving into management roles and they are starting to be more of a part of the way the organization itself is managed. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And so the the principles that we talk about in the book that are it's the principles are based on research talking to many, many millennials and also comparing that like in a big Venn diagram, right? Because I'm a consultant. So comparing that to companies we found that have really, really awesome cultures mm -hmm. um, and seeing where the overlap is. So the, the four principles are digital, clear, fluid, and fast. Mm. So digital, of course, is what you'd expect, but it's, it's not just technology. It's actually user, user focus and the user is the employee or the customer or the member. Um, Clear is about more information sharing. So millennials just want to know the context behind decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and they're perfectly happy to, to abide by decisions that come down from on high. If they're more junior, they just want to know why, because they have, they've grown up with this sense of really having access to all the information in the world at their fingertips. Um, and then fluid is about hierarchies. 
Um, but it's interesting because it's not about flattening hierarchies. It's actually very important for hierarchies to exist, for people to know, you know, where the reporting lines are and then that kind of thing. Um, there will always be people who have more experience and people who have less experience. But it's about being flexible with those hierarchies so mm-hmm. that the, the person who's leading a meeting can change based on who has the best information or, you know, the most interest or the most energy around a project or whatever it is. So being able to be more flexible um, in those ways. And then fast is, is kind of leap ahead speed. And that's, that's basically based on trust. So what can you uh, let go of control of in order to be faster um, as an organization in a competitive marketplace? Now, is that related to Agile in particular or? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's definitely related to Agile. Um, It's, it's not just um, technology, though. So, uh, for example, we had a, a great case study for that chapter in the book, which is um, Happy State Bank in Happy, Texas. <laughs> so this is a big bank with, you know, several thousand employees and several um, branches. Um, but they are fast because they their entire business model is based on personal relationships So, for example, they don't have a call center. When you call the bank, you get the person that you actually see in the bank branch that you belong to so that when you actually walk into the branch, you know, they have this they've built up this personal relationship with you. They know about your small business and, you know, all of your banking related stuff. Um, and therefore, they can make decisions much faster in terms of um, approving loans for your business or whatever the case might be. And, you know, through this huge banking system, that's how they operate. Um, that's so really cool. Very it's personal. Really, really cool. Yeah. Really cool. Um, and it does, it sort of underlines the idea that it's, these changes are not all technology based. Because I think we we fall into the trap of, you know, if we build it, they will come. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mm, yeah. In, in the chat, Avi says this kind of fluid trust and letting go requires candid feedback when people misunderstand expectations. Can you kind of address that a little bit? And how do we manage expectations when, you know, both on both sides of the, the communication, both on the client side and, and on the management side? Yeah, it's... um. This is where actually technology helps a lot. So it's about opening those lines of communication. And I think um, the when expectations are not met or when people um, don't agree with decisions, for example, it's because they don't have enough information. It's because they didn't get the reasoning behind those decisions. Mm. Um, So feel arbitrary. Yeah. And people Mm -hmm. will always think the worst. Right. They always yeah. fill in the space with the most like dire, you know, like negative scenario possible when actually the truth behind a management decision might be something really simple. Mm. Um, That's but, where clarity comes in. Yes, exactly. So all of these principles that I mentioned are all related to mm. each other and they build on each other, too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more then about what you're doing with WorkXO, because I think this really ties in well. You talk about a thing called mapping the workplace genome. Can you kind of explain how that process works and why we should care? Yes, yes, of course. So um, it's so mapping. This is our big the heart of what we do is what we call mapping the workplace genome. And it's what it sounds like. It's a scan and a, a culture assessment. So it's a scan of your organization's culture um, and it measures things like um, agility that we mentioned, uh, collaboration, growth, inclusion, um, technologies, which is, again, a little bit about the digital mindset, not just the, the technology tools that you use. Mm-hmm. Um, and then transparency and innovation. So it's it measures very different things. Um, and these things have all come out of the research behind our books too. But it, it, I feel like it measures different things than your traditional culture assessments. Um, and the, the really big thing that is different is that many culture assessments are basically trying to say that there is a right way to be, a good way to be, mm-hmm. and that you're either good on the good to bad scale 
or you're not so good and therefore you have to change, right? Whereas we believe that if you're trying to get from point A to point B in terms of your culture, you have to do the work of understanding your point A. So you need to really understand who you are authentically um, as a culture. Um, and this relates back to what we were talking about around um, authenticity and bridging generations and history versus the future. You know, all of those things are important and part of a culture. And a culture is not just core values on the wall that are aspirational, but completely disconnected to your daily work. That never happens. No, never. <laughs> you know, or, you know, there are a lot of organizations use um, employee engagement surveys. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that they don't work. Mm. The reason they don't work is because they're a Band-Aid on things that may be visibly going on in your culture, but you, they don't, they don't uncover the underlying reasons why there's silos or why there's n lack of collaboration or why there's, you know, all generational differences or whatever. So, um, so what this is what we're trying to do is provide a tool that really helps organizations understand who they are. Mm -hmm. So there's two reasons you would do that. One is culture change. You like, you're aware of issues and you want to fix them. Um, the other one is to be able to, to share how awesome your culture is, you know, in order to actually um, recruit the right, the right people. So um, that's the realm of employer branding and, um, and talent, talent recruitment and culture fit. So the idea of culture fit is, you know, how can you really hire the right people for culture if you don't really know what your culture is? Mm -hmm. you know? How can you be authentic if you don't know what it is? Yeah, and, and yeah. it's right now it's completely dependent on the interviewer telling you what it is as mm -hmm. if you're the, the person coming in for a job interview. So there's a lot of of not of of whatever the opposite of clarity is. There's a lot of mud yeah. <laughs> in all of that. Right. You know? right. Um, so uh, so yeah, this is this is all the, the um the work that we're trying to do is to really provide much more nuanced and thoughtful clarity around what it's really like to work somewhere. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is that once people start talking about what that culture is through social or with their friends, you know, actual social interaction, you don't want to be misrepresenting what the company is so that when somebody comes in, they're like, wait a minute, this is not at all what yeah. you said it was. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so many employers are just desperate because they're recruiting people who leave really quickly because it's not what they thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And they got a lot of churn. Huge, yeah, a huge retention problem, which costs a lot of money, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have things like everybody's heard of Glassdoor, right? And and sites like that that are that allow individuals to review the companies that they work for. Mm -hmm. um, and the huge problem with those is that it skews very negative. So if yeah. somebody's going to take the time to write a review, it's 80% of the time, and I'm throwing that number out in the air, but a huge percentage of the time it's going to be because they're pissed off because they had a bad experience or they're being paid to put in a really positive review yeah. you know, to try and balance that yeah. out. So yeah. either way, it's not the <laughs> truth necessarily. Right not it's not the truth that might apply to the next person um applying for that company um mm -hmm. so you know that's another area where it, it just seems like there's a lot of new kinds of thinking that could be done around how to really share what it's like to work somewhere so that that organization can really attract the right people who will really feel like they belong there mm -hmm. um, and so everybody can be more successful well, and let, let's speak to that a little bit too. how, you know, once, once you've defined what the corporate culture is and you've defined maybe what the company um, culture and what they're putting forward as an authentic self, now we're moving into how do you as an employee share for the company or write content for the company that is authentic as opposed to yet another canned press release? Yeah, that's right. And and so this is what to me is really, really fascinating is that 
you know, we're starting to build out a whole vocabulary and language around what it's like to work somewhere that can very specifically be translated into um, social media posts. Um, and so the work that we're doing in that regard is specific to uh, recruiting related posts. So mm -hmm. come work with us because, you know, we're X, Y, Z. Um, but, you know, stemming from there, you could actually have, you could build a whole toolkit of, of things that employees could use to actually promote the company mm -hmm. uh, or organization to their, to other people that they know in their networks. So it's, it's exponentially awesome, I think. <laughs> <laughs> exponentially awesome. I like that. So let's talk about then, uh, you know, say we've got a CEO or CXO who already has an existing, you know, social media accounts. They've maybe just come into the company. How do we allow them to remain authentically who they are and still obviously they're representing the company at the same time, whether they like it or think so or not? Yeah, the I mean, I think to me, that's actually one of the most interesting things about that connection between social and um, the authentic workplace culture, because a culture is made up of all of the humans that work in that organization. And I think a lot of, I mean, I actually feel quite sad in a way that a lot of the humanity has been sucked out of social, you know, as it becomes more, I mean, it has become more and more and more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So now it's like the marketers have taken over, <laughs> you know, and I sort of am one. So, you know, taking that with a grain of salt, but, you know, it's almost like we've, there's so many policies and procedures and uh, best practices and all of these things in place now that, that it's hard for people to really remember that, this all started about being about individual people connecting with other individual people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if, if we had the right words to describe our culture and to, to describe our purpose, you know, as an employee of an organization doing something, um, then you could protect against some of the risks that CEOs are so afraid of you know, while still allowing for some individual, um, some individual differences in how you talk about your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really do think the the power of individual people sharing what they do for an organization um, is completely untapped right now because social media is kind of shoved into the, the marketing department or the PR department or the communications mm -hmm. department and nobody else is allowed to, to touch it now. Uh, yeah, and people, please stop doing that because that's just wrong. Yeah. You know, they're totally ignoring the fact that they have an amazing workforce. Maybe not everybody is amazing. Maybe not everybody should be, you know, representing the company as a whole. But anybody who works for the company rec represents the company in some yeah. way. Yeah. And how do we how do we keep that authenticity? You know, is it trying to cur curtail people from saying what they really think is going to backfire sooner or later. Right. Yeah. So how do we allow people that leeway? Do you, do you recommend like, you know, guidelines for companies for employees that are using social? Well, I actually do. And that's something that, that we did a lot of work on in the early days of social fish um, my social media consulting firm, a lot of our work was around social media policies. Mm -hmm. um, so I def I think that's very important, um, especially because there are now laws related to all this stuff, you know, that people right. need to know about. Um, but they also need to know what's protected in terms of your individual ability to talk about your, your workplace. That is protected information. Mm -hmm. You cannot get fired for that. Right. <laughs> So, so just having the honest conversation about what's okay and not okay, e even philosophically, and then what's okay and not okay legally, those mm -hmm. are, are two different things, but they're part of the same conversation. Um, yeah, I agree. But it's not necessarily a rigid structure where, you know, yeah. say this, don't say this. I mean, no. I tend to tell people if it's not on the website, don't talk about it. You know, if it's especially if you're an engineer or maybe you're going public or those kind of things can be really crazy. But 
we still want to see your personality. We still want to know who the people are that work at that company that we want to connect with. And to me, that's part of the authenticity conversation. You know, if you're a curmudgeon, go ahead and be a curmudgeon because <laughs> you can't really hide that for very long. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Exactly. And the fact, I mean, if you have, you know, a disclaimer on your, on your blog, I'm a curmudgeon. No. Yeah, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, even if, or it's actually the other way, if you don't have a disclaimer, it doesn't mean that people won't figure out that you're working for whoever mm. you work for, <laughs> you know? So, um, it's it's complex, but I think just being able to have those conversations around what's expected um, and what's right is is really important. And and it's too easy to fall back on the completely strict rules. Um, and I think most of it is actually mm -hmm. not about the strict rules. It's about the gray areas. Right. Right. Yeah. And I really do think that social media policies in particular, you know, they're if you don't have one, everybody's afraid to say anything. Yeah. Um, you know, they need, people need guidelines. They want guidelines. They want to know what they can do and what they can't do, but they don't want to feel like it's oppressive. So find yeah, some. Yeah, back to Avi's comment about expectations, actually. Mm -hmm. if you have a sense of what the expectations are for your social media presence as an employee, then you have, you feel much more liberated to actually be able to go and, and talk about stuff on social. Right. Yeah. Liberated is a perfect word for that because it really is, you know, that you just go, okay, you know, because it, it can be very um, challenging for people to go, oh, I don't know. Can I say this? Yeah. And it, oh, geez, just say something. And, you know, the more, the worse you get, the more authoritar authoritarian you are about it, the more your employees are going to just shut up. Yeah, they will. Not to mention that it's impossible to police. If mm -hmm. you put strict rules about everything, you know, it just, nobody has time for that. <laughs> yeah, you can't spend all your time, you know, deeply embedded in social analytics only to to watch your employees. Yeah. If you are, then you've really got a culture problem. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Avi did have another question. He said, does the tool including... Does the tool include culture fit assessment tools for income candidates to complete? Huh, Avi? He's coming. Oh, incoming. I see. Okay, so that's that, okay. <laughs> yes. No. It, so it doesn't. It's basically the genome is a an ass a survey assessment, mm -hmm. um, and it it goes to all the employees of. A company of an organization right now so it's not for incoming candidates um it's to develop the vocabulary ar around describing what your culture is so mm -hmm. obviously you need to be in the culture you need to know it right. to be able to describe it right but it's um it's also a benchmark so what we would hope and we just launched this a few months ago but what we would hope is that organizations come back a year from now and they and they do it again. So they get a snapshot every year of what's evolving in their culture and what's remaining. Um, so in both of those cases, it's it's not for incoming people so much as people who've been there a little while. But what's actually really interesting is we have lots of um, demographic segments. So you can compare different offices. You can compare tenure, so somebody who's been there a year versus somebody who's been there 10 years. Um, you can compare gender, male, female. You can compare race if you had enough people for that. Um, obviously, departments. You know, any segment that we have in the data, mm -hmm. you can compare and contrast the genome results for those segments. Um, Generations obviously is is really awesome. So you can compare how boomers think about the culture versus how millennials think about the culture. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually cares about what Gen X thinks. You know, I am one. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the forgotten but, generation. You know, like, I'm just not even mentioning them anymore. <laughs> slash us, um, but we're we're cool with it. You know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so it's those different ways of perceiving the culture, mm -hmm. uh, I think is really fascinating because then when you start to think about who you're looking to hire, 
um, you know, maybe you can start using some of those differences in your marketing messages um, if you're trying to reach out to a particular demographic. And I actually just read an article just a couple of days ago about a whole bunch of tech companies starting internships for 40 somethings. Oh, I love that whole yeah, discussion. It, yeah. It was really, really cool. And it's, you know, a lot of um, mid career people going back to work after having kids. Mm -hmm. um, but so there's, you know, that's a demographic that people are, or that companies are trying to reach very specifically because they have great skills. Um, but they maybe don't have the traditional career path because they took some time out. Mm -hmm. um, so that would this would be a way that, you know, if your company wanted to do that, you could figure out the right messages that fit your culture plus that demographic. Yeah. And also identify holes in your culture that, you know, you can want to balance things out a little bit. And I think a lot of times, you know, we don't stand back and look at that um, yeah, exactly. clearly at all because we're too busy working in our businesses, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't actually step back and, and look at them. And um, no matter what size business, I think we're all guilty of that at some level. Yeah, that's right. And that's actually, um, I mentioned core values earlier, mm -hmm. but this is one of the big issues with core values is it's, you know, it's a nice word up on the wall, but you know, if you have collaboration, um, innovation, <laughs> like if I can name your core values, it probably doesn't mean much. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? The, they're so disconnected from daily work that they just become meaningless and sort of like apple pie. Like nobody can can dispute that innovation is a good thing, you know. But right. what does it mean for me as an employee? Well, mm -hmm. right now, not, you know. Yeah. So there's that too. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with you, Maddie, as always. And I want to let people know I'm going to post a link in the chat here to uh, the blog post that you wrote on True Selves on WorkXO. And, you know, I was really interested in your explanation of what XO stands for in WorkXO <laughs> because I assumed that it was hugs and kisses too. And I thought, oh, that's so cute. But yeah. you... Yeah. So it's a great conversation starter. Um, it does mean hugs and kisses. It also means... Um, XO like tic-tac-toe or like a playbook, like a football mm -hmm. playbook. Um, and it also means um, X.0, like 2.0, um, which is actually the very originating nugget of how we came up with it was was um, work 2.0. And then of course mm -hmm. we said it's always evolving. So there's no two, it has to be you know, X.0. <laughs> um, that's how we found our, our URL originally. Um, and, but we just love the fact that it's, it just means something different to everyone. And all of those explanations are completely correct. So the hugs and kisses part, like love being part of why you, why you work somewhere. Like I want to bring out more of that. Mm. <laughs> we need more of that in our co company culture. You know, I, I think that company, um, not all companies, some company cultures are much more warm and much more fun to be with. And so, you know, I think as we see companies developing more towards mindfulness, they're starting to be yeah. more authentic. They're starting to be more real. And I just, I love that. Yeah. And I think, you know, you spend so many hours of your life at work. It's part of your identity, whether you work for yourself or whether you work for a big organization. So being able to really bring out the true kind of meaningful relationship between the individual and the mm -hmm. place where they spend all of this time, um, I think is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Maddie. And uh, why don't you let people know where they can find you so that they can follow you on social? Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. So I am Maddie Grant on Twitter uh, and the website is workxo.com. And thanks everybody for joining us. Don't forget to look up Maddie on Amazon. She's got three books on Amazon. She forgot to mention the community one, which is <laughs> ancient now, but still <laughs> awesome. So um, awesome. I think so, cool. <laughs> so make sure that you look that one up too. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. And thanks again, Maddie. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.